Hi, I'm Andre. I'm going to show you how to make a physics based blowing fan. So uh, I must mention that this implementation does not use fluid dynamics, so it's not entirely physically accurate, but it does a pretty well job. Uh, the advantage here being that it, this one has a lot, uh, uses a lot less resources. Okay, so let's see how it works. So I've made here, there's a blowing fan, there's blowing uh, air upwards, and we've got four uh, walls that keep the objects in, one of which is glass, we can see through it. And as you can see, the simulation, I think it's pretty convincing. We can put other objects in, like this, and it simply works. If we get these out, we'll see that it, with different shapes, the, the objects with different shapes uh, act differently, as you can see here. So, let's see how we can implement this. So the, the uh, principle here is very simple. We have a box like this one that detects objects and uh, we just do line traces inside this box and when they hit the object, they apply forces to it. So that's it, it's very simple. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's see this uh, really quickly. So if we activate the line traces here, we'll see them. So there are quite a few line traces, but it's not that many and uh, the frame rate uh, stays uh, uh, relatively high. So let's just um, let's create a, an actor here like this and first we'll create the the box that you see here and we'll detect the objects so what we want to do what what i've done here actually if you look at the actor is i've configured the range so we can configure the range dynamically for each one if you take this and drag it you can configure it we also can configure the distance between the line traces so this is useful uh, when we have uh, smaller or bigger objects, so we can uh, so we can detect the objects, okay. And there's also a setting for the max force. So what we want to do now is configure this box and these three controls right here. So if we go here for this, we'll use a, a box collision like this. We we'll call this range. <coughs> now the box collision uh, in order to scale it does not I mean you can scale it normally but uh, usually what you'll do here is uh, you use uh, the box stents now the box stents actually only uh, they are only in one direction so if you see 32 here this box is actually uh, 64 because it's 32 like this and 32 like that so uh, first let's uh, put the box on uh, to start from zero uh, on the z-axis so we'll do that in the construction script like here we'll take and we'll set its location its relative location like this so just split this and we'll set the Z location. The X and the Y will leave like that. So it's going to be centered in the horizontal plane. And we'll take this and we'll say get box extends. Like that. And from here, we'll split this and take the Z extent. And uh, we'll just plug that into the Z location. Because we want to shift it with the the and you you see it already shifted with the half of its uh, uh, length on the z-axis so this is good it's what we wanted and now we want to scale it so for that we're going to create the three variables that I talked about we'll, we'll create them here so we call them range x it's a float and we'll make that visible 
range y also visible and range z also make this public also so in order to set this we'll take the range from here and set its box extends like that and we'll put this before that the relative location because we use the box extends here so we need to set them before okay so let's split this and we'll take the range on the x-axis sorry about that noise neighbors are redecorating okay and we'll say so this range what we'll consider here we'll consider the whole range from left to right so we'll have to uh, divide that by half to make that in half so we can get the box extent okay so just copy that twice like that and we'll put here range y and range z I'll just plug that in and it should be working already yes but we haven't configured them yet they are default values like this I'll put here 200 300 and 600 let's see okay so we can already drag this in like this so as you can see if I modify this it will get modified there okay now we've got this down sorry about that let's get here okay now what we want to do is detect the object that enter in this volume so we'll do that in the event graph we'll just get rid of the event play and the others and we'll do this in the event tick. Um, we, there are other ways of doing this, uh, uh, but we just for simplicity, we'll just use event tick. So we'll get the range and say get um, overlapping components like that. And also here, we want to check that this the length of this. Uh, array that it gives us is more than uh, zero like this so here we'll branch like that and we'll say if if the number of objects that are overlapping is more than zero then we're doing something because it's only in that case that we want to do something either if if not we just stop here so this will help us not consume any more resources when uh, when not, there aren't any objects in the volume okay so what we want to do now is in this volume right here we want to cast uh, line traces upward so let's see how we can uh, do this so here we got let's say a top view of the object and we got here the origin let's put it like this and what we want to do is we've got the box like that so we just want line traces to go upwards when they come to the camera okay uh, like this like this well it's a it's a matrix of them actually okay so we have this here we know it we know this one also so what we need to figure out is the distance well actually we're going to define also the distance between them like this and we just want to know the number because uh, we're going to do two for loops one which goes on the horizontal and one on the vertical so we can generate them so let's see <coughs> So here we'll do for loop this one right here. So we have indexes and another one right here. So we drag from loop body. Okay, not from completed. Very important. So what we need is these indexes because we're going to start at zero, but we need the x index and the y index. 
So let's let's see how we can uh, calculate this. So here, so we have this. This is range range x and range y, and this is let's call it d for now. So it's the distance between them. So we need to define that the distance between uh, line traces. Well, let's say force lines. Like this. You should always try to put names that are um, that can be understood by anyone not not related to the implementation if you can. So this one on the x-axis will just take the range on the x-axis and we'll divide that by the distance between lines. Of course you can do this differently. You can put the number of iterations here but we're just going to do this like this because it's more simple it's simpler to just to set that um, depending on the size of the objects okay so we'll divide that and we'll say truncate so if we truncate like this so if this is 2.5 for example it's going to be 2 here so we plug this in into the last index first index is going to be 0 let's plug this here and also for that one we just copy this and we'll put range y like that and we'll put it here okay so now we're actually um, um, we're going through these um, positions now let's Let's calculate actually, because it we just uh, doing uh, for loops, but we don't know the positions. So the positions we we'll calculate in the relative, um, uh, relative to the the object, and then we'll we're gonna uh, translate them into world coordinates. So here uh, we'll have we'll start with this. And I'll just I'll just pick peak inside this one just really quickly so I don't make a mistake. I, I prefer to do this from zero because from the start like like you see here because it's just more easier it's easier to explain and it's also easier for the for the viewer because it seems more doable seems like something they can achieve. Okay, so as you can see here, we just um, we're actually we'll take in the distance and we'll multiplying that multiplying that with the index that we have here. Actually, it's it's multiply integer like this. So this is on the x-axis. Now we've got the position. But well, what we're starting with is we're starting from here. Okay, like this. So we're starting from here. But we're gonna uh, shift that back. We'll see. So this is on the x and on the y it's, well, it's the same thing. I'll just take this from here and try to use reroute points that really organize the code better. Okay, so now you have these all the positions here in locals in relative space to the center of the object, and we want to shift them. So we just we need to uh, shift them by the boxy a box extent, but you know, uh, we can take the box extent, but we can just take here from the range. So we just divide this uh, like this by two. And we'll say this one minus that one. Okay. 
So we'll also take this here and take the range on the y-axis and we'll subtract um, from this, this one. Now what we've done is we've moved this here so it's centered. Okay, so we have the x and the y. Now we want to um, do the line traces upward like this. So we need, we have a location, but we also need the location uh, up there. So um, where it's the end of the line trace. So for that, we're actually going to add on the Z axis. So uh, let's put, let's, let's just add here line trace for now. And we'll use line trace by channel like this. And we use channel visibility. And here we'll just for one we'll draw one frame for now so we can see. Check trace complex also. And that should be okay. Now what we need here is the coordinates in the uh, world space. And these are the coordinates in local space. Uh, and for that, we're getting the actor transform like this, and we'll do uh, now here. Let's make a vector like that, and we'll put in the x and the y. The z will stay at zero for the start because uh, we're starting here and going upwards okay sorry I'll just close that one okay now this one is actually the beginning the start here so let's convert this one so we'll say transform location like that and this if you look here it's actor to world so if we transform this with the actor transform, then it's exactly what we want from local, from relative to world. So we'll plug this in here. Okay. So now we've got the start of the line trace and we need the end. So this one right here is the point, a point on this surface. So we need to get this one here. So we just uh, just uh, use this one and add to the to the z axis so we'll we'll add a vector and just split this okay and we'll add to the z exactly the range on the z so this will not split this in half because we've shifted it upwards okay so it's the middle is here but we've shifted so We'll take the range Z and plug it in here. And then, uh, I'm not sure, uh, yes, yeah, so it's plus, okay. So that should be okay. And we'll also transform this from local to world. So put this to the end. Okay, so now I can plug this in. So very important here, we'll plug into the loop body. Like, like here and let's see if this if we've done this correctly okay so we need a transform through here we'll take the, the actor transform so let's see if we've done this correctly now we can't see that here because we've actually activated the detection of objects so let's just We'll just go around this for now. Uh, that's not good. Okay, that's it. So let's see now. Well, we just got one. Why exactly is that? So the range, let's look at the range. That's correct. Okay. So loop body here. Mm. 
Well, that should work. Why doesn't it work? So it's obviously it draws every one of the the line traces, but it's probably in the same place. So let's see why. Range we've got here, range x, divided, truncate, okay. That's because the distance is zero. That's the problem. Okay, so let's put this to 15. So it's this is kind of a guesstimation, but you can you can uh, you can put your own values in. Okay, so we've got the matrix of line traces. So that's good. That's what we wanted. So let's go further. So we've got this down. Now we want to check. <clears throat> now we want to apply the forces, but first we want to uh, check if we hit something or not. So let's do the, this here. So we'll branch here and we'll say if it hit, if it's returned the value, then we can continue. And we're going to check again here like that, because what we want to check here is that the object is simulating physics. So we'll say, but first we have to break Break the results here, like that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, we've done multi-line, tra multi-droid trace. I don't know why, but let's, let's do that again. So line trace here by channel. Okay. So this is what I use. Why I use reroute nodes? Because you can replace them easily. So you should do like this, like that. Okay, so let's re-plug this, okay, and then we can break this, plug this in again, okay. Now, here, we take the, the component here and we say is simulating physics, like that. And if it is, then we can continue and we can use it. Like this. Okay, now here we get to apply the force. So the force, we'll just do first the, the simplest version and then we'll complicate things so it's uh, more accurate. So the force we apply to the, the component, you can pull from here, like that, and we'll say apply force. Uh, Add force actually at location because we'll actually apply so uh, the point where we hit the object we're actually that's where we're gonna apply the force like here and so the force we're gonna see about that and the location is gonna be the impact point right here we'll take from this okay now the force <coughs> We'll take, we'll, we'll just create a variable here and say max force. And we'll say max force because we're actually going to calculate differently the force. It's going to depend on the distance from the fan, but we'll just say max force for now. And so this is the magnitude vector of the vector and we need the direction. So the direction, we can take this very simply and it's going to be the direction of uh, z upwards, okay? But uh, can we use this one? No, let's just take uh, the actor. So get uh, uh, sorry, I'll just pick here, pick here. It was the uh, vector get up vector this one okay sorry about that get up vector and this is get actor up vector like this so this is the up vector in the world coordinates in world space so we can use it already like this this is why i didn't because we can we could have put uh, the location zero zero and 
uh, one on Z and transform that. But this is gives us in world coordinates. Okay, so this is a normalized vector. So we just uh, we just uh, multiply that with the force and plug it into the force right here. Okay, so now we've got a simple working, normally simple working uh, rolling fan. Let's just plug again the detection and let's try and use an object and see how it works. Okay, so if, yeah, now we don't see it anymore. Okay. So if we go here and we take the range and we deactivate the hidden in game option, I can see this. Okay, so now as you can see, it doesn't detect this. Uh, let me just deactivate this because it's gonna eat resources. Uh, so this here will just, actually we'll just take this out, you know. Just delete it like that. Okay, so we got it rid of it. So let's see here. Okay, so the problem is we don't detect the object. So let's see why. Now first we have this range right here. So let's see what is it overlapping. Now we've got some options right here. So we have to first we have to check multi-body overlap because we're going to have multiple objects overlapping probably and also trace complex on move so it's going to trace uh, objects so let's see the detects now it doesn't let's look again so let's just check here overlap all but it shouldn't be this one no it's probably here This has to uh, generate. Uh, this has to generate um, overlap events. So let's see. It does. Okay. So let's see here. Why doesn't it work? Let's just play this and see. So yeah, apparently there is no, uh, wait, sorry, should, I should have kept this here. Okay, that's really small. Okay, so we'll take the object, where is the object? Okay, that's weird. So we'll take this put this here so if you look here a static mesh component so it does work it's because we don't draw it see that's the problem because we change this multi-line trace with single line trace that's the problem so if we put this here, as you can see, it works. Now the force is probably not strong enough. Let's see, or did we set the force or not? So we didn't set the force. Let's put the force here to, let's say 15,000 like that. So just very important, this force will act in each point uh, that we trace. So this is why, because usually you put 100,000 or something, but because there are so many points, it just adds up on the surface. So that's why it's only 15,000. 15, okay, so let's see here. Ah, yeah, the problem is it collides with the ground. So let's see if we take this again. Yeah, so as you can see, it already works. So this is a very basic implementation, but you see there are problems with this. Because if we put this at the edge here, look what happens. So as you can see, it just, what happens is uh, it rotates the object instead of pushing it 
to the right it just grabs it it's like it's grabbing it from here and pulling it the force is pulling from the object it's not pushing the object so let's see uh let's see what is this hap uh, let's see well actually i don't know exactly why this happens but let's see what the theory is in this so when we have the surface let's say it's a cube like this like that and this is the inside of the cube and we apply a force here what happens is that in real life the forces actually get split like this so it pushes the, the object upwards and uh, horizontally so but what this does uh, in the engine right now it's just just the uh, upward force so it doesn't pull it uh, push it on the side so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna say so our force that we apply here in this point we want to scale it because when the 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 surface of the object is more vertical and the force is like this the force should be less so if we're applying a force here and it's close to perpendicular it should be greater than the force that is here okay so we're gonna do that by scaling the force by <coughs> by the surface so we're going to use the surface normal that is like this and we're going to split this so we're taking the direction from here from here our direction of the force we're projecting this one onto the surface normal and we'll take this vector this uh, magnitude of this vector so that is done with the dot product so let's see I'll do this first and we'll see about the direction of the force because that has to change also otherwise it's uh, still gonna rotate okay so we got the force right here so well we want to actually put this like this we want to uh, scale this uh, force by the the angle that uh, the angle of attack on the surface okay so let's um, so we have to take the uh, impact normal this one here like this which is here and we'll just uh, because the, the force that we apply it's always going to be on the inside of the object we just flip the normal like this so we get this one right here so we'll just negate that so now it's this one this one right here and our force is like that and we can do our force direction is actually the the up direction here so we can do the dot product between them like this so now what this gives us because you're gonna notice that it's give us a scalar value not a vector so it's actually the uh, the magnitude of the vector that is here the length okay so that one We'll just use so it can go from zero to one when this is like like right here it's just almost zero and it's like that our force is perpendicular it's one so this will allow us to scale the force that we apply so here we'll just uh, add an uh, absolute because it might be uh, negative so this will actually uh, multiply with the force so it's gonna scale so this goes from 0 to 1 it's gonna scale our force from 0 to 1 okay so if we try again it should be better but it's not we haven't won the fight here yet okay so this way well, you can't observe it now but it's already better well if we put it in the middle here 
yeah so now what we have to do further than that because that is not sufficient we actually have to split we actually have to change the direction of the force so again if we do this again we have the same surfaces here so you have the force <clears throat> that we apply vertically and the tangent that goes like this <clears throat> so what i found is that the direction of this force actually has to be so if we continue like this it has to be the sum of th this one and the um, uh, the normal now i don't remember exactly why this is because i've done this a while back uh, and uh, i can't remember exactly why this is good but as you can see it works so we're gonna use it like this if there's someone that knows uh, how to calculate this better just please comment this and i'll rectify I'll, I'll pin your comment or something okay so we have our uh, direction of the force and direction of the normal so we'll add these vectors together and it will give us this direction and we'll just normalize it so it's one okay so let's see here so we have the app vector okay that we're gonna add to the uh, the impact normal so it, it was already here okay so it's negated this is good because it's this way now so this will just normalize it so we got a vector of magnitude one going this direction and this will change depending on the angle this angle right here it will change it will go like this or like that but it will not be able to go more than 45 around the tangent so it's going to be so if you have the tangent like here it's going to be max like this you cannot go more than this like that and more than that like this so it's good okay again i don't know exactly why but it works uh okay so we got this direction here so let's see again yeah so we had it the direction we had it in was the up vector so we'll simply replace this here okay yeah so let's try again now so it should work yeah the force is too strong Let's say 10,000. So as you can see, it works more naturally now. What we're gonna do is actually put it in here so we can test it better. That's why I done, I've done this uh, structure so the objects don't fall out okay so let's test these so as you can see it does work it does uh, behave naturally let's put this in because it's a more special object it just increases mass a little bit yeah a hundred should be okay take these out put this in so as you can see it behaves more or less like uh, before yeah so it works okay now let's because we've done this just we don't need the lines anymore just we'll just hide those okay so what can we do now okay so first let's add the um, uh, Let's add uh, this, uh, the propeller, because it looks uh, better like that. So the propeller is very simple. We're just adding a static mesh like this, called propeller, like that. And I have a, I have a propeller 
um, uh, mesh here. I've actually used it in another video with a propeller, a physics based propeller. You can get it from here if necessary. I can put it in this uh, video also. Okay, so we've got this here and we want it to rotate. So we're gonna add a physics constraint to it. Well, of course, we can do this non physics based. You just uh, set its speed, angular speed or something. But we can add it like this so the objects can, can actually. Uh, interact with it and it can even even stop if uh, an object is really heavy okay so let's configure it so first component we've learned this recently so we don't need the first component so it means the physics constraint will be linked to our object but the second component will put to the propeller like that if you look here yes we've got as you can see, it's colored, so it works. The linear limits, we leave them locked. The, the angular limits, we just lock everything and unlock the rotation in the horizontal plane. So let's see which one is that. So it's this one. Okay, that's good. And in order to make it rotate, we'll go here to angular motor. We'll select to stand swing and select a target velocity and we'll take swing here because we have swing motion and we'll say a rotation around the z-axis here now this is uh, this number is in rotation per second so let's put this uh, slow at first let's say one rotation per second and this is the force that it uses to arrive at this rotation at this speed angular speed so we'll put here a thousand just to be sure you can put this lower, and if you put this lower, it's more easily uh, di disturbed by by objects falling onto it. Uh, so I think it should work. No, it doesn't because we haven't activated simulate physics on this one like this. Okay, so let's try again. So as you can see, it rotates, and we can actually grab it. Okay, so this is more like of a visual effect or something, because it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the forces that uh, we're uh, projecting. Okay, so this is good. Uh, let's just do one thing. As you can see, the box is right here, and actually, because this uh, propeller simulates physics, it's going to detect this one. So. If we go here and reactivate our lines like that, you're going to see that it actually um, it just freeze these. Uh, just deactivate physics like that. So as you can see, it's already activated. That's because it detects this one. So what we're going to do is just shift this upwards. So let's go here. We'll take the range. And we actually have to do this in the construction script because we're already configuring it. And we'll just add a float like there. Here we'll just add it. Let's say we'll shift it to the uh, with 20 like that. Uh, actually more. I think it's 30. It depends on your mesh. So it doesn't intersect the mesh. That's the important thing. Okay. So it should be okay like this. Um, well, it's not actually, because it still detects it. Just a second. What's happening here? Yes, uh, just uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> That's because we haven't plugged this in. Okay. Okay. So now you can see that it doesn't intersect it so it, it's not active or you can control the rotation if you want so it's when it rotates it's actually active but it would take too long to show everything here okay so we've got this done now let's add in order to be more realistic here let's just put this in so we'll test so this the force is too strong. Let's uh, well, actually, yeah. 
We'll just leave the fourth like that because we're gonna test this. Uh. Now, as you can see here, what it does, it's, it actually works, but the forces are now hom homogeneous. So the problem is that the flow of air actually is more random than that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some randomness to the forces that are applied here. So, but first we have to scale the force on the vertical. So the, 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 um, the propeller acts more strongly here and as the air goes upward, it acts less and less. Of course, normally if you have fluid dy dynamics and walls like this, it will act almost uniformly, but you know, we can't exactly simulate that here. We're gonna have to uh, just, just mimic. So we, if you can put this with the size of the walls if you want, but we're not gonna do that, it takes long. Okay, so we'll say the max force applies here and then it's go, it's go, it goes upwards, it's less and less. So up, up here is just zero. So we'll take, so we're gonna scale this by the distance between here and here. So it's actually, we can use something from the break heat result, which is very interesting. It's the time. So the time is actually the time it takes for the, the, the uh, line trace to hit the object. So it's going to be, if it hits right here, it's going to be zero. If it as go further, it goes, it goes towards one. So if it doesn't hit, it's one. If it hits here, it's something like 0 0.8. So we can use exactly that. So we drag the time from here, just use a reroute. So we need actually the opposite. So we need, so we want to uh, multiply this like this. So we're gonna multiply our force with something, but it has to be one here because here will be full force and zero here. So we're, this is the other way around. So we're gonna have to uh, make one minus that. One minus, uh, it's minus uh, float actually. Sorry about that. So one minus our time from here will actually give us a time from one here to zero here. So we're just simply gonna multiply that by our, by our force and we're gonna plug this into the amplitude. Okay, so we'll say this is, this, this is the direction and we're actually, yeah, so this is, we're scaling the force with this one um, because of the, the angle of attack and here is the direction, okay? So I'm not gonna label them anymore, but yeah. So the scale, the scale with the angle of attack comes after this, okay? Now, so this should work already. Let's see. So I haven't changed the force just because you'll see right now, as you can see, it already digs through more. Let's just deactivate the line force. Like that, just okay. So it will see it more naturally like this. So as you can see, if it falls from upwards, up uh, it digs into the uh, the stream of air more, and that's why I haven't um, uh, scaled this more. The force of uh, haven't uh, changed the force. Okay, so now that's good, but we still haven't added the, the variation. So here we've got still got uh, the constant force everywhere. So what we'll do is actually we'll add, we'll add from here. We'll take also, we'll add a um, percentage of the, the max force. We'll add it back with a random ratio. So let's say we'll add it after. Uh, no, we have to add it before. Before we scale with the tangent. 
or with the angle of the tech. So we we'll have to add it here. So we'll say like this. As just <coughs> sorry about that. Let's float like this. So we'll say actually from here. So we'll take our force that is scaled with the distance and we'll add some variable number. Okay. So that number is going to take our force, we'll multiply it with 0. Point something, let's say 0. 0.5. So it's going to, it's going to take 50% of the force and we're going to scale that further with a random number. So we're going to multiply again with a random, uh, random float actually. Okay. So we'll take a percentage, uh, we'll take a random ratio of this 50% of the force. So let's put that again. Yeah. So let's try again now. So it's, it's not going to be easy to be uh, noticeable this. But what it does is actually, as you can see, the object actually moves around. Okay. So as you can see right here, it doesn't settle. And that is because the force always fluctuates. So that's good. This is uh, simulates air. Okay. So what can we do now? Uh, let me have a look at what I've done before so I don't forget something. So we're adding this, we've done this. We scale the force, that is good. Calculated amplitude. So apparently we've done everything from here. So this is kind of it. The only thing I would want to show you more is if you want to really have kind of like a, a real simulation of a blowing fan. Now, if you've uh, watched some um, stuff about th this, the, the fan is actually the air that blows. It's not a continuous stream. It's actually because these uh, the parts of the propeller um, uh, hit the air. It's actually a stream of some kind of like a intermittent stream. So what we could do is actually use the, the movement of this propeller to interrupt the flow of air. So we just have to block the line traces. So let's activate the light traces again. Where was it? Here. So put this again. Uh, so if we put this here back like that. So you can see they're all red now. Uh, that means that they're hitting only here. So they're not hitting the, the propeller. So we can we can actually make them hit the propeller. Okay. But let's see why it doesn't do that. I think it's trace complex. I can't remember exactly. No. Um, it's trace channel visibility. Let's look at the propeller. So the problem is that the propeller is not detected by the traces. It's maybe this one, trace on complex. Uh, so let's put this in back. No, it's not that one. Um, so let's look. It's a physics actor. It blocks everything. A multi-body overlap. We don't need that. Uh, so I'm not really sure why it doesn't work. Let me look at the options that I had before. 
So I've got trace complex here. And let's see, but we don't need to detect it. And here, physics actor. So that's weird because it should work. Because if we take this out and we try to. Yeah, so as you can see here, why it's flickering like that it's because all of the all of the line traces actually stop here from when the the uh the propeller passes so uh that should work so this is just the problem of tracing um so it should be fairly simple Ah, yeah. So this is this is the problem. It's because is ignore self is on for us. So this. So yeah, <laughs> simple things like that. So when you have ignore self, the trace is actually gonna ignore all the children of our actor. So if you try again now, it should work. Uh, well, it should work. That is weird. Because that's the problem that we had, actually. There was no other problem. Uh, ignore self. Trace complex. And here the propeller. Ah, yes. And I think overlap events had to be on also. Yeah, but it is on. That's the problem. What about the roller lamp? I don't think this is a problem. Yeah, so I'm sorry about this, but it should work. I mean, it's just a problem of trace. <coughs> it doesn't detect the propeller. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can't see the problem right now. Maybe it's some someone screaming at the screen because they've already seen it and I couldn't, but yeah. So I think I'll leave this one to you. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the comments afterwards uh, because I'll probably find it very easy. But yeah, I can't see it now. So yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, so now it works almost um, as, as physically accurate as we can with this uh, method. So I'm just going to tell you a few words about how we can configure it. So when you have, so if you look here, we've got the range. This is simple. Okay. But this is the most important. So the distance between lines. So this, you can get this smaller when you have smaller objects. But don't go too small with that because what it will happen is you're going to have uh, hundreds of line traces. So it's not that good. But yeah, you can still can do this. But don't go too low with this. Okay. Now, if you want to uh, uh, make this more efficient for, let's say you have an, a small object like this. Well, this is not small, but let's say you have one that is like this and the other one is like really small like that. Let's see. Let's test this one. See how it goes. Okay. So yeah, it it's probably couldn't work this one because, well, sorry, I put, I, I didn't put this here. So it, it's, it's detected, but as you can see, it doesn't work because the line traces are too far apart. So, of course, what you can do here is very simple. You can get this down to, let's say, five, but it's going to be a lot of line traces. Hope it's not a problem because I'm also screencasting. Yeah, so it does get, yeah. But let's test this. I want to test this. So, it. yeah, sorry about that. Uh, come on. So, 
So as you can see, it does kind of work. So what you can do with this here, if you have a difference like this, I'm not going to implement it because it will take a long time, but I'm going to show you really quickly. So let's say that our surface is like this. Is the center and we have an object like that and one like this okay so what we can do is actually with our box that we already have we, we can detect the objects and get their uh, get their location so let's say I have an object here and an object here okay so we have a sphere and a cube so what we can do to um, make this more efficient is we're actually can can do an array of line traces only around the objects so you get you get the the limit um, the extent of the object so it's a sphere around the object that even if the object is like this it's gonna be the extent it's gonna be like this okay so you can take that and only apply an array of uh, line traces around that okay so it's gonna be so let's well, I'll take this here okay so let's say I'll, this is zoomed in okay so this is a small object but here it's zoomed in okay so its extents are like this and what we'll do is actually uh, make a matrix of line traces around only around it and these can be um, dense okay like this yeah so here we'll do the same thing but these because the the object is is bigger they can be more um far apart so uh, you get the idea now the only problem here would be that you have to define so you have to define um, a density of force on the on a surface and when these line traces are uh, um more close to each other the force is going to have to be uh, lower because if not this object will get pushed so you have this here and one small here this one will get pushed a lot more because there's a lot more li for line uh, f force lines here so just yeah make sure that you define for a surface i i don't know like uh, centimeter squared you define a force and then you divide it you just divide it by uh, by how many points you have in that yeah so this is how you can uh, make it more efficient for when are, there are a lot of objects and different sizes actually not a lot but just di di a different a big difference between sizes like you have here and uh, you can also do that one that I haven't shown you because I can't remember exactly what the settings are. So you get, uh, but you have it here. I've shown it here. So as you can see the, uh, you know what? We can see this really clearly if we edit this. So we get here for the constraint and let's put this to 1.2, just really, really slow like that. So you'll see this actually. So look here. So you can see where the line traces are intersecting the propeller. And they affect, uh, they affect the flow of air. So it's more realistic like this. It's, uh, an air uh, a propeller like this, it, that's what it does. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, I hope this has been useful and uh, if you liked it, if it was useful, don't, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions, leave a comment and I'll try to answer it. And I'll see you in the next video.